well then what's your explanation for hakeem jeffries coming to the rescue on this front because we know he hates the left right that's why he's in the position he is that's why he's probably going to be the speaker or the democratic leader in the house for the next few decades um and he has the capacity to fundraise a lot that's a prerequisite for that kind of position so um he uh recently uh, started a, a pack with Josh Gottheimer and others in order to ensure that leftists in primaries would not win. So that's his ideology. And she, as I mentioned earlier, despite the fact that the New York State Supreme Court, you can draw a direct line to electoral losses for Democrats in the House on the federal level, he has come to the rescue and has decided to throw his weight behind LaSalle and Hochul's effort here. What's your read on the calculus behind that? Is it just, is it just an anti-left thing or is there something more broad that's happening here? It's a really good question. It's one of these things, again, where it's like if these people would just do what was best for themselves, it would make so much more sense and it would actually work better. Right. But again, what what is what does Jeffries have to have to win from this? I, I can't see anything. I mean. You know, already the math, we, you know, you and I and everybody else could count with 14 state senators in the Democratic Party saying that they weren't going to support uh, LaSalle. That meant that he had to get Republican votes to get confirmed. So already, you know, the, the calculus is simple for Jeffries to jump in on this on this, um, you know, this like charm offensive that Hogel went on last weekend, which was, you know, she was up in the Bronx rallying on, on LaSalle's behalf. And, and Jeffries spoke as part of that. And then she went to Sunset Park in Brooklyn and. Uh, was you know invoking Martin Luther King to justify the nomination of uh, of LaSalle. And uh, you know, it's just like the whole thing was so incredibly misguided. And and why would Hakeem Jeffries jump in on that? Like why why was that something he felt like he couldn't miss? Um, I I wonder. I I mean I think that you know this is something like old habits die hard where you know in the old New York Democratic Party this would make sense. This is something that he would love to participate in, you know, in the past and certainly when he was Part, you know, more sort of intimately involved in New York machine politics. Right. But as the highest ranking Democrat in the House, especially, you know, the Biden administration has really championed these uh, these sort of more left wing, non prosecutorial. Uh, That's the thing. Who, Biden's right. breaking records in nominating judges. And we're talking about how Republicans want to steal elections and their threats to democracy. And the leader of the Democrats in the House is rallying for a conservative nominee for this New York Court of Appeals top position to switch a majority. Right now it's 3-3. This would make it 4-3 conservative. It is mind blowing. It's mind blowing. Yeah. It's totally crazy. And again, just on a very sort of like constituent services level, like the the whole thing that the Democrats have been talking about since Hakeem took over was, you know, this is unity. Like we're all on the same page. Like a woman's right to choose is not up for question. Not like, too. you know, we support labor like more than we ever have. These sorts of things were supposed to be like, you know, these are unanimous. We've decided on these principles. They're, they're non fungible. This is the democratic party and compared to the Republican party, which is riven with, you know, uh, discontent and, and all these ideological factions. Like here we are, um, and we overperformed in November because of our commitment to these things. And then, you know, two months later, uh, like that, it's a huge, it, it's actually a huge problem for him too, because right. If it, it, these major women's groups, like these aren't small groups that were saying that we can't support LaSalle. These were major national groups. And so what are they thinking when they see him rally for LaSalle after they specifically said, not this candidate, please pick another candidate. Um, it, it actually is really threatening for the whole democratic caucus at a higher level than just New York. And, and that's another thing where, you know, this sort of statewide ineptitude that we've seen from the party is not just a statewide issue. It's absolutely a national issue. And um, beyond even just the fact that, Demo you know, Jeffries might be Speaker Jeffries if, if the New York Democratic Party got its act together, not just leader Jeffries. Um, but again, I don't know. Uh, you know, these certain there are certain ways of being that, that are hard to uh, or certain patterns that are hard to break. I think that that was an example of that where, uh, you know, I think Hochul called in favor. He, he probably thought that this was the sort of thing that he's done a million times. and It shouldn't be that big of a deal. And I, I don't know if he was counting the votes or what, but uh, not a great look. Yeah. Uh, long time listener. Uh, first time call. I've been trying to call you guys for a while. Um, so I just wanted to talk about the Hogel thing. I think. Um, sorry, I'm a little nervous. No, you're OK. You're doing great. Um, yeah, that. You know, you guys, uh, Matt and Bradley and you, Emma, brought it up at the beginning of the show about how Hochul is like, uh, 
the ba- a bad version of Cuomo. I think we can agree about that. Mm-hmm. And how... Um, An incompetent you know, one, at least. Oh, yeah, of course. And so I think because, you know, I, I was on the Kristen Gonzalez campaign uh, over the summer. And my, my point is, um, I think we need to remind people in New York that she is essentially Andrew Cuomo. And maybe we can just start calling her sarcastically Governor Cuomo. Sure. You know, as, as a personal insult. I mean, I, I you know, think I think it's useful to keep pointing out that Cuomo handpicked her um, as his number two, and that's why she is where she is. And her political career up until that point is not um, at all remarkable or interesting. And like, I, I just can't get over who this person thinks she is. Like, like given that, like you barely squeaked over the line um, in the the first election, you actually had to run for the office, and now you're trying to do this. Like, it's it's crazy. To and me. sunk the rest of your party's nominees essentially exactly or, uh, yeah. elsewhere in the city and state. It's nuts. Um, good job working on Kristen's campaign, uh, Alex. Uh, you know, good job getting involved. And hey, she. Uh, She's in there, so that's that's good. Yeah, yeah. Can I can I just say one one last thing sure. about Hogel? Um, yeah, and I think what we have to do is, and I the reason why I brought Kristen up is I think her and like AOC and uh, what was his name uh, from Florida? Oh, the, uh, Frost, the Maxwell Frost, Maxwell Frost, Maxwell Frost. I think I think they I think the millennials and Zoomers have to start primarying uh, these boomers and silent generation Democrats to stop the Hokels and the Eric Adams and the Hakeem Jeffries who are the, and uh, who are like essentially just the, the uh, generation X like carbon copies of these old timers. Mm. You know, I, I think that's what, I think uh, that's what we have to do because, you know, we, we, I think New York is a microcosm as we just saw with, with our mayor and governor that that's what's going to happen. And I wonder what's going to happen when Hakeem Jeffries is, is a uh, majority leader of the house. Yeah. It's speaker. concerning. You know, it, it'll be the same thing. I appreciate the insight. Thanks so much, Alex. Thank you for your call. Thank yep. you for your time.